Hey, what up guys? Today I'm going to talk about the new Sue's Rain DLC, Rizia. Um, it's the new DLC for the modern cult classic game, Sue's Rain. Um, maybe cult classic's not the right word, but you know, it's a great game and rather one of a kind in my opinion. Um, if you're not familiar with it at all, it is a text-based political simulator where you take on the role of a president of a fictitious country, Swordland, which seems heavily inspired by Turkey. Um, the world of Suzerain takes place like on a whole nother planet. There, of course, is similarities to real life. As the world has a cold war going on between the communism and capitalist countries. Um, they're not called that in-game, obviously. But in the game, they also follow their ideologies a lot more, unlike their real-world counterparts. I know that might sound a bit controversial, but I mean, come on, it's not like America is a true capitalist society, not now and not back in the 1950s during the Cold War era. You know, there wouldn't be bailouts, subsidized companies, or millions of regulations, and if the Soviet Union was a true socialist or communist country, you know, there wouldn't be these big factory owners or an iron fist from the top of the state, you know, there'd be workers' co-ops and sharings of resources more equitably. You know, feel free to disagree with these perspectives, but obviously in the universe of Suzerain, these countries actually follow their ideologies much more uh, seriously. Um, so while this is a political game, I don't want to go too deep into my own personal politics while I review this just because it's divisive and <laughs> nobody cares. You know, either you agree with me and that does nothing or you disagree with me and it kind of like you know, makes the rest of my opinion suspect to you because you're like, oh, if he believes this stupid shit, why would I believe him about this? So I'm going to try to keep that to a minimum. So I think Suzerain, um, the base game, is a solid 9 out of 10 in my opinion. Um, it's really interesting guiding your country in any direction you want. You can reform it and make sure the country maintains its democratic values, or you become a dictator, or you can become, well, different types of dictators. You can become a communist dictator, a more Pinochet capitalist dictator, a more author authoritarian Democrat, where there's still democracy, but you have a bit of a tighter fist over the state. There's a lot of options, but in this new DLC, you play as a king, which I think is really interesting. Um, the country of Rizia has some more Saudi Arabia vibes, in my opinion. Like, it's obviously not a one-to-one -one copy because the population is a lot higher, and it used to be an empire, which Saudi Arabia has neither of those things, and it never really was. I mean, I guess it was part of the Ottoman Empire, somewhat. But, um, you do definitely play as a king. It has heavy, like, religious vibes. Um, you have, like, a religious advisor. But those are just the vibes I'm getting. You play as a king at a at the country's crossroads. The people want a more representative government, but it's up to you whether or not you want to give it to them. I mean, you can maintain the status quo and have a sort of like a democracy for show, but really have all the power. Or you can become like a hardcore theocrat and become a god king. Um, really a lot of interesting options and paths. I also find it interesting um, just because I imagine most of my audience lives in a liberal democracy of some sort. Like, sorry if you don't, if you live in, like, North Korea or Russia or, I don't know, Belarus. <laughs> I'm sorry if you do. That must not be awesome. But, you know, I imagine most people don't live in a country where they have a king or political figure who wields all total power in the country. So I think it's really interesting to get that perspective. Um, I've always had sort of a deep fascination with monarchies. I actually just finished reading up um, God, uh, Democracy, the God That Failed by Hans Hermann Hopp. Um, I think it's really interesting because I do think that, I don't know, I find monarchies to be one of the most interesting forms of government because obviously if you agree with the monarch, you probably enjoy it a lot. And if you disagree, it probably sucks. But I guess that's how most governments are. So I thought it was really interesting to play a game where you get the perspective of the monarchy and you also want to protect or maybe expand the power of the monarchy. Most games involving monarchies usually have you overthrowing them. You usually don't have the option to expand its power. So I thought the developers were really smart with deciding to have us play through with like a whole different government system than just have the DLC be like, you know, a different republic and just kind of have like the same choices but in a different, different area of the world. 
I also think the gameplay differences are really cool. You know, this time around you have three stacks to keep track of that replenish every turn. There is energy, cash, and authority. Um, those are all pretty self-explanatory. You know, you get a plus a certain amount each turn depending on your actions and trade deals with other countries. I honestly prefer this system over Sue's reign because I think it makes more sense in my opinion to, um, you know, unlike Suzerain kind of implies, countries do get money, you know, kind of often. They do get, like, replenishments to their coffers, especially if they have state-run corporations or nationalization of any kind, like both Swordland and Rizia have at the start of the game. So I'm not sure why you wouldn't get more replenishments of cash. Um, I do have a bit of a problem with how authority is shown in this game because it's very hard to get and you need it to do basically every decision. And then also a couple of bad decisions you can shoot yourself in the foot and get zero authority per turn. And I think that the game needs to do a better job of kind of establishing what choices will take away your authority. Because I think in real life you would obviously know, oh if I assign this the people are going to like me less. Which I mean, some of them you can definitely see that. But then other times it's like, you know... Um, you can sign a decree that makes it so you have more religious freedom and now it's you get less authority because some religions don't like you. And it's like, I don't know, I kind of thought that might be balanced out with more people being able to practice their own religion, but I guess not. So I think that maybe needs a little bit of a rework or I think you should get like a higher base level. Because if you're doing a reformist playthrough, um, it can definitely be hell. <laughs> you know, getting like plus three authority per turn and not being able to really build or do anything. Because in this game, instead of having to pass laws, you know, through a legislature, you have access to, ro to royal decrees. You know, as a king, there is a series of decisions that you can make that affect, you know, everything. You have basically the power to do anything you want. You can legalize drugs, you can build new gas plants, make the conscription age 18. Um, you know, the only thing that you are stopped by is your money and authority reserve. So I definitely think that's a very cool system. Definitely a lot um, a lot better than Swordland where you have to, <laughs> you know, wait for the legislature to pass laws. I thought the story of this game was great and all the characters were super awesome. It was super interesting to see a lot of these characters from different perspectives. Like I'll start with some of the bigger players you interact with such as Witcher Smolak, the, the rather uh, funny dictator of Welland, a country that occupies some of Rizia's land. So, in the base game, he's rather desperate to make a deal with Swordland. So, you kind of hear and somewhat see about how awful and cutthroat he is. But you don't really get too much of it. And you kind of like, I don't know, you don't hate him as much as you should. But in Rizia, he kind of holds all the cards and he will just fuck you over. So, this game, you definitely dislike him a lot more. I mean, you know, although considering he's a genocidal dictator, you should probably... Just already dislike him. But this game you really you're like oh, okay. I can see why everybody else was like making you out to be a terrible person. Another from the another character for the base game you get a new look at is President Alvarez of Lesbia. I won't spoil the game, but he is up to some bad shit and he is constantly trying to undermine your country. Which there is a big difference because in Suzerain he either doesn't like you because you're a communist, or he's super friendly with you and your capitalist ideology. He doesn't really try to undermine your country or threaten you, um, you know, even if you go against him in his political block. Meanwhile, in Rizia, he is just fucking shit up for you, even if you're nothing but nice to him. Even if you say it is my country's intention to maintain friendly relationships, he is just doing shit to fuck you over. Um, I think the story is really great. I like how you have to deal with having a country that has multiple parts of it, uh, of its, you know, de jour land under occupation and how you can deal with it either through diplomacy or warfare. Um, I think like all of the characters are well written, like all of your royal counselors I like a lot. Um, I like all the characters in your family except for, you know, your dipshit fascist cousin who can't even run a city he has absolute power in. Like, holy shit. Like, it's fucking awful how stupid he is. But, I mean, he is a fascist, so that tracks. Um, sorry, NFP fans. Um, 
I just think the family dynamics are a lot better because you spend so much more time with them because obviously you're a king. It's a hereditary monarchy. So family ties are a lot more important. You also get to spend a lot more time with your daughter in this game and it's great because she's not a total fuck up and she is willing to sacrifice her happiness for the country. She actually wants to be a good queen and wants to learn how to run a country. She's a lot better than your uh, kids in the base game, Sue's Reign. Um, I also like how they uh, added romance. I thought the romance was pretty real Winton. Um, I enjoyed the straight romance options. Sorry guys, I did uh, did not enjoy the gay romance. I didn't try it out. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just not interested. But based off how the rest of the game is written, I'm sure it's great. You know, these writers are great. The developers are great. Um, the DLC, as I mentioned, does introduce warfare, which in my opinion... It sucks. It is the worst part of the game, in my opinion. I'm glad you don't have to interact with it. Because I can see why they thought it was a good idea. But but I want to know whose idea it was to only allow you to move four units per turn. Wh like, what's the point of me having this huge army and I can only move four of them per turn? Like, I, I can understand why they didn't, like have you do like a whole RTS type of thing. But just let me move every unit once. Like I don't understand why you couldn't have done that. Why are you hampering me? Like it's not like it's not like the warfare is that interesting anyway in game and now you're gonna hamper me even more in an attempt to make it harder. I just think that's uh I think that's very stupid. And I also don't like how there's only like certain predetermined times you can go at war. You know, like, I'm the king. I think that there should be a decree option that allows you to go to war where, depending on at what time you activate it, you either do have an actual caucus belly to, de to declare war or you can uh, make a false flag or something. And when it give you different buffs or debuffs, because it sucks. Because the first time you're playing, you might not know when to start building up your troops or you might start building up too late. And then the subsequent times you play, you know that you have to start rushing military hard if you want to do military if you want to do like a military run. So I think that having a decree would allow you to have a, li a little bit more replayability. Um, I think that the ending to this game is pretty great. No matter what option you choose. I think it's all pretty satisfying. Especially after the devs uh, rework some of the uh, some of the problems with the day one version. Because a lot of people were getting the coup ending no matter what they did. Which I had like the same problem. I felt like I shouldn't have been in a, in a place where I got cooed. Like, um, especially if you check the subreddit, some people were having things where they, like, where you can kill your uncle, but then they were still having him lead a coup against the government. So, I, like, you know, he came back as a zombie, and now he's about to get crowned king. Very scary times for the kingdom. So, I'm glad that they're starting to fix that. So, you know, other than some bugs, I think it's a great game. I would give it an 8.5 out of 10. I found it to be almost as good as the base game. Maybe just maybe just because the base game got the newer update and it allowed it to um, kind of flourish and you have some different things to do. So, I think that once you give them some time, because this basically is just a sequel. I would say it's almost as long as the original version of uh, Sue's Reign. So, I think it's really good. I think you should check it out. It's super cheap. Um, it is only on PC for now. Sorry, Mobile Bros. Um, you're probably not going to get it for a while. But, um, that's all I have. Um, like, subscribe, and remember Jesus loves you.